in the previous lecture uh, we are discussing about uh, the inelastic analysis of uh, three uh, dimensional frame uh, a single story three dimensional frame uh, with a rigid slab on the top of it. Uh, the frame was asymmetric as a result of that under the action of earthquake a unidirectional earthquake uh, there will be a, a torsional rotation of the frame about a vertical axis leading to the development of the bending moments in the columns in two directions. Uh, this requires the consideration of the bidirectional interaction uh, effect on yielding of columns and that was uh, the main point of discussion in the previous lecture. And we had seen there uh, that uh, individually the columns may not yield in each direction separately, but uh, so under certain combination of the bending moments in the two directions the column may yield depending upon the yield criteria that is assumed. And uh, when a uh, column undergoes yielding then the tangent stiffness matrix or uh, the instantaneous uh, stiffness matrix uh, that gets modified and this modification uh, is done with the help of a stiffness uh, matrix called the plastic stiffness matrix Kp. The elements of uh, Kp can be obtained with the use of certain formula uh, which we had uh, discussed in the previous lecture. And with this modification of the, the stiffness matrix of the columns. Uh, the entire stiffness matrix of the system is assembled and then uh, we analyze uh, the system for the subsequent uh, increment of loading or the subsequent uh, interval of time delta t. And after we uh, get the response uh, the incremental response at time delta t then we add this uh, displacement in, uh, to the previous displacement and gain the total uh, displacement uh, of the columns uh, in the two directions. And also we obtain the rotations uh, with the help of that uh, the bending moments in the columns can be uh, computed, the yield criteria can be checked and uh, we make sure that uh, at any stage of calculation the um, conditions of the bending moments uh, are such that they should not uh, uh, cross uh, the yield surface or uh, the, the yield condition is always satisfied. Uh, if the combination of the bending moments lead to a bending moment greater than the yield moment uh, that is it goes out of the yield curve then the bending moments in the columns are pulled back. So, that uh, the, uh, the total uh, bending moment uh, becomes equal to the yield moment and it remains on the yield uh, curve itself. And how to uh, do this uh, pulling back that was also explained that requires some iterations and with that uh, the help of that iteration uh, we make sure that the uh, bending combinations of the bending moment in the columns are such that they all the time remain on the yield surface. Uh, now uh, in this uh, lecture today uh, what we will do is that the concepts that we had discussed uh, in the uh, previous lectures that will be extended to multi-story building frames. Uh, in the multi-story building frames uh, the number of stories and the number of bays uh, may be too many and therefore, uh, the idealized conditions that we discussed for a uh, two-story frame or a single story frame those idealized conditions uh, may be difficult uh, to implement. Uh, therefore, uh, we uh, do uh, some kind of, of approximation uh, for uh, extending 
the concepts to the multi-story building frames. Uh, especially uh, in order to implement uh, uh, those uh, methods for the multi-story building frames, we uh, make the delta t to be very uh, small, so that uh, the errors which are developed due to the approximation, uh, those errors are very little or those errors are minimized uh, as a result of that there is not much accumulation of the error to upset the final uh, response. Now, for the 2D frames, uh, uh, what we do is that uh, first we identify the potential sections of yielding uh, at uh, the uh, different uh, uh, cross sections of the uh, frame. And for that, uh, we isolate two cases. One is the case where the uh, beams are weaker than the column and in the second case, where the columns are weaker than the beams. First, we take up the case of uh, uh, when uh, the columns are weaker than the beams, uh, that is the columns are in yielding. Uh, in that case, uh, we first increment uh, the loading at small increments and apply onto the uh, structure and we calculate uh, the bending moments at the specified sections uh, where uh, we uh, look for uh, the case when the columns can undergo yielding. Uh, now therefore, at those cross sections uh, we mm, uh, check the bending moment and when the bending moment uh, at that cross section becomes uh, equal to uh, the uh, plastic moment or the moment carrying capacity of that cross section, we say that uh, that particular cross section has uh, yielded and for subsequent delta t um, uh, or subsequent increment of loading, we consider an ordinary hinge to be present at that particular cross section and accordingly write down the stiffness matrix for that particular element, uh, or, element uh, or the column. Then uh, we assemble the entire stiffness matrix uh, after considering uh, the ordinary hinge at the plastic hinges. Uh, once you have done that, uh, then uh, uh, we uh, use that particular stiffness matrix for finding the uh, response of the system uh, to the next increment of loading. And uh, when we get uh, that uh, incremental uh, displacement, uh, then uh, we uh, add the incremental moment to the previous moment and uh, um, uh, see whether other cross sections are yielding or not. If uh, uh, the m uh, which is computed at the end of any calculation uh, becomes uh, equal or greater than the plastic moment, uh, then uh, at the, the end of uh, the uh, delta t, uh, we what we do is that uh, we do not uh, modify uh, the uh, calculation uh, the way we had done for a, a two story frame uh, or a single story frame where uh, when the system passes from the elastic state to the plastic state, then uh, we find out uh, the point at which uh, the plastification takes place and therefore, apportion uh, the loading incremental loading into two parts. Uh, one part of the loading uh, takes the system uh, to the state when it just reaches yield point. And then uh, uh, the other part of the loading in which uh, the uh, system behaves plastically and uh, the responses are calculated for these two parts separately and add them together to get the final uh, response. However, uh, when the, uh, the number of stories and number of bays are too many, uh, these kind of calculation uh, 
uh, take a lot of computational effort and it becomes somewhat cumbersome. Uh, therefore, what is done is that if the bending moment uh, at uh, the end of a time interval becomes greater than m at any particular cross section, uh, then what we do that uh, we assume that at that particular cross section uh, there is a yielding and uh, by assuming uh, that there is a, a yield hinge that has uh, occurred at that particular point, we uh, obtain a revised stiffness matrix for the entire system. So, this revised uh, stiffness matrix and the uh, stiffness matrix that you had calculated uh, in the beginning of the time interval, uh, these two stiffness matrices are taken and averaged and with the help of that average stiffness matrix, uh, we finally obtain the incremental displacement or incremental response of the system uh, to the incremental loading and uh, that is how we uh, proceed. Similarly, uh, when uh, uh, we uh, obtain uh, that uh, at the end of uh, the time interval delta t, uh, there is an unloading uh, which is taking place. Uh, then also we uh, do the same kind of uh, calculation. Uh, we constantly monitor the velocity is at uh, the yield sections. Uh, these velocities could be the rotational velocity or the displacement velocity uh, depending upon uh, the uh, kind of problem that we are solving. If you are solving a problem in which the columns are only yielding, uh, then uh, we constantly monitor the displacement uh, 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 velocities and uh, uh, these uh, displacement velocities when uh, they change their sign. Uh, that means it becomes negative. Uh, then uh, we uh, assume that the cross section has, uh, uh, has been unloaded uh, and uh, during that time interval. Uh, then at the end of the time interval, we assume uh, a, the stiffness at that particular cross section uh, to be is equal to the initial stiffness uh, of the cross section and with the help of that we obtain a total stiffness matrix of the entire structure and, and that uh, stiffness matrix is added to uh, the stiffness matrix of the structure in the beginning of uh, delta t, average uh, the stiffness matrix and with the help of that average stiffness matrix we find out the final uh, incremental displacement of the system subjected to the incremental loading. Uh, so, for uh, doing this uh, the necessary uh, condition uh, is that the delta t should be small uh, because the approximation that we are making by averaging the two stiffnesses uh, that approximation should not lead to a much accumulation of the error. The concept is uh, um, explained with the help of uh, the example 6.4 uh, in which uh, uh, we wish to find out the moment at the base of a particular column of the frame uh, that uh, I am going to show you in the subsequent slide. Uh, and it is subjected to El Centro earthquake and the uh, results are obtained for two cases. In one case, uh, the, the members uh, that behave elastoplastically, that is the columns behave elastoplastically and in the other case, uh, the column behavior is, uh, is a bilinear uh, backbone curve. Uh, so, the problem is shown over here. Uh, this is a shear frame and therefore, the columns are only yielding at the bottom columns we have uh, the stiffness is 1.5 k uh, and the upper two columns we have the stiffness k. Uh, the displacements are x 1, x 2, x 3 no rotation is involved. Uh, the values of mass and the stiffness that is given and uh, at cross section A we wish to find out uh, 
the time history of the bending moment. Uh, the two cases uh, of uh, the uh, behavior of the column is shown uh, with the help of the force displacement curve uh, of the column. Uh, we take uh, two cases, in one case uh, uh, we assume the system to be perfectly elastoplastic that is at the bending moment of 346.23 kilo Newton. Uh, we assume that the yielding takes place and after the yielding uh, the uh, system or the column uh, continues to uh, displace under the same bending moment. Uh, so, this is the perfect elastoplastic case and the uh, initial stiffness uh, of this elastoplastic system is given by K i. In the second case where we consider the column to behave uh, by linearly, uh, in that case uh, the after the yield point that is the uh, yield moment or yield force of 346.23 uh, kilo Newton, uh, the, there is a uh, stiffness of the system that stiffness is called K d and K d is uh, assumed to be is equal to 0 0.1 times uh, the K i that is the initial stiffness. So, for these two cases uh, the uh, results were obtained and the uh, method uh, that was discussed uh, before uh, that uh, method uh, was adopted. Uh, in the case of uh, bilinear uh, curve, uh, wh whenever we find that uh, the bending moment has exceeded uh, the yield uh, uh, value, uh, then uh, the uh, stiffness of the system uh, is taken as K d or stiffness of the column is taken as K d uh, not as K i. Uh, and unlike uh, the case of perfectly elastoplastic case, uh, we uh, do not consider a ordinary hinge uh, to exist at the point of the plastification for subsequent calculation. Uh, we consider that uh, that particular cross section uh, still can take uh, uh, certain value of uh, the uh, force or uh, that is uh, able to uh, take uh, the uh, shear force or the bending moment uh, under subsequent loading, but with a reduced stiffness of K d. Uh, so, in that particular way we perform the uh, calculation. The final results uh, uh, for the two cases are shown over here that is the plot of the bending moment uh, with uh, time uh, for the elastoplastic case is shown in uh, the figure 6.10 and 6.11. Uh, we see that uh, the uh, bending moments uh, are, are varying in such a way that over the small value of delta t. Uh, the uh, values of the bending moment are almost stationary or horizontal. Uh, the force uh, displacement relationship uh, is, uh, is exhibiting uh, the case of perfectly elastoplastic state. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, the upper line for the force displacement curve uh, is almost a horizontal line and uh, depicting the perfect elastoplastic uh, state. Uh, for the second case where uh, we had a bilinear curve representing the force displacement relationship, uh, the uh, bending moment plot it uh, shows that uh, at the peaks uh, the values are not remaining stationary over delta t time it is slightly inclined uh, and showing that there is a small variation and because of uh, the um, by, uh, or, uh, because of the uh, uh, some stiffness uh, that we find uh, uh, after the yielding uh, or the stiffness that is represented by K d. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, these in the portion at the top is not perfectly horizontal. The force displacement relationship also shows the similar trend, the upper uh, curve uh, is not perfectly horizontal, it is slightly inclined 
and this inclination is produced because of the uh, stiffness, reduced stiffness KD uh, after the yielding has taken place. Now, if uh, the uh, moment rotation relationship or the force displacement relationship uh, is uh, not uh, idealized as a elastoplastic perfect elastoplastic or bilinear curve, uh, but by a nonlinear curve, uh, then the tangent stiffness matrix uh, for each uh, delta t is obtained and this tangent stiffness matrix is obtained at the beginning of the time interval delta t. Uh, with the help of that tangent and stiffness, we calculate uh, the entire stiffness matrix of the system uh, and then uh, find out the incremental displacement or incremental rotation uh, of uh, the uh, uh, members and the system for the incremental loading. Uh, if unloading takes place, uh, then uh, at that uh, state, uh, we assume that the uh, system uh, is having or the members are having a stiffness which is equal to the initial stiffness. And therefore, uh, uh, as we find that uh, there is an, an unloading for a particular element at a particular cross section then the in place of taking the tangent uh, stiffness uh, at that particular uh, uh, for interval, we uh, consider the initial stiffness uh, for that particular uh, element and go ahead with the calculation. Uh, in order to uh, um, improve uh, the accuracy, uh, uh, we do the same thing that is uh, whenever uh, there is an unloading uh, or whenever uh, there is a uh, movement uh, from one state to the other, uh, then uh, what we do is that we find out the stiffness matrix at the end of the time interval and the stiffness matrix at the beginning of the time interval. Uh, these two stiffness matrices are added together, averaged and with the help of that average stiffness matrix, uh, we find out the incremental, final incremental displacement or response uh, over the uh, time of delta t whenever uh, the system is unloaded. Uh, however, uh, whenever the system is not unloaded, but monotonically increasing over the curvilinear uh, force uh, displacement relationship, uh, then uh, we go on, on calculating uh, the in uh, tangent stiffness says at every point or that is uh, at every interval of time t. Now, in order to aid that calculation, what we do is that uh, the slope of the backbone curve uh, that uh, are obtained at some discrete points and they can be inputted into the program. Uh, whenever uh, uh, any point lies within in the two or such uh, points where the interpolated values are available uh, or, or where the, uh, the values of the tangent stiffness matrices are available, uh, then uh, the, the value for any for value for uh, any value um, at a particular point in between those two points uh, can be obtained by interpolation. Now, next we come to uh, on the case uh, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, the system uh, is having a, uh, uh, a weak column and a strong beam, but the system uh, is a, a 3D system. Uh, in that case, uh, the method that we described uh, before for a, a single uh, story uh, frame, three dimensional frame, the uh, same method is extended uh, and the um, uh, stiffness matrix uh, uh, which is called the tan uh, your um, transient stiffness matrix k t uh, is obtained as k e minus k p if uh, any section of the column uh, is yielding. 
uh, during the increment of loading. Now, by considering uh, the uh, yielding of the columns and uh, thereby the modifications uh, that arise uh, due to this yielding uh, leading to a modified transient stiffness matrix K T for the element, uh, we assemble uh, the total stiffness matrix of the three dimensional frame and with the help of uh, that uh, modified uh, stiffness matrix, we find out the incremental displacement of the system uh, for uh, the in, uh, increment of loading over uh, time delta t. Uh, only thing uh, that one has to take note of is that uh, for individual elements, uh, when we uh, make the modification to the uh, stiffness matrix by including uh, the plastic stiffness matrix part that is K p, uh, then, uh, uh, then we must uh, uh, attach the coefficients to the appropriate degrees of freedom and uh, in the overall stiffness matrix, uh, those modifications should be uh, duly incorporated uh, in different places uh, denoting the positions for the different degrees of freedom. Uh, therefore, uh, what is generally done is that uh, the sections which are yielded uh, at those sections uh, whatever is the degree of freedom uh, that are associated, uh, they are arranged uh, accordingly uh, in the entire sequence of the degrees of freedom. Uh, then the solution procedure remains exactly the same as before uh, that we have described for the case of a uh, single story uh, three dimensional frame. Now, if the three dimensional frame is a weak beam strong column system, then the problem becomes uh, simple uh, as the beams uh, undergo only one way bending. Uh, the case of bidirectional interaction on yielding does not come into picture, uh, because uh, uh, if we look at the beams uh, in a three dimensional frame, they cannot undergo any lateral bending because of the high uh, stiffness of the slab. So, therefore, they only undergo a uh, uh, vertical bending and uh, thus the beams are subjected to only one way bending. And one it, uh, once it is having a one way bending, uh, then the analysis procedure remains the same as that of the 2D frame. Uh, so, for a 2D frame or the 3D frame uh, having a weak beam strong column system, the calculation procedures uh, remains the same, uh, but uh, some extra uh, precaution has to be taken uh, for uh, condensing out the rotational degrees of freedom uh, in the uh, system, uh, because the rotational degrees of freedom do not enter into uh, the, uh, the problem as a dynamic degree of freedom. And um, in most of the cases, we condense out uh, this rotational degree of freedom. Now, in doing so, um, uh, these uh, condensation technique uh, can be uh, uh, quite straightforward uh, whenever the system uh, or the any cross section has not yielded, uh, but after the yielding has taken place at any particular cross section, uh, then a special note is to be taken uh, care of uh, in the condensation procedure to take uh, into account the uh, effect of the yielding of the cross section. Now, uh, this involves some extra computational effort and that is explained um, uh, with the help of uh, uh, the example of a two story frame that uh, I will be explaining shortly. Uh, but uh, um, first what we do is that after we have obtained the incremental displacements. Uh, from that incremental displacements, we calculate the incremental rotations uh, from the relationship uh, that uh, exists uh, in the process of the uh, condensation uh, 
and uh, with that relationship we find out the incremental rotations from the incremental displacements and those incremental rotations are then uh, added uh, to the uh, previous uh, rotation to find out uh, the final rotation at the current uh, state and uh, we uh, we see uh, that uh, whether uh, the plastification has uh, uh, taken place at a particular cross section. Uh, similarly, uh, we record uh, the uh, not only the rotations at the cross sections, but also uh, record uh, the uh, or trace the uh, rotational velocity at the particular uh, section where the yielding has taken place. And if we find that the rotational velocity uh, is uh, uh, or moves from positive value to the negative value, then, uh, uh, then there is an unloading that has taken place at that particular cross section. And we take appropriate uh, measures uh, to take into account this uh, the, the effect of unloading. Uh, the, uh, the procedure uh, here uh, is uh, explained for uh, these uh, two story frame uh, that is shown over here. Uh, the, uh, the frame uh, is uh, uh, having a uh, antisymmetric uh, case uh, because uh, under lateral load uh, the frame will behave antisymmetrically. As a result of that, uh, we consider uh, only delta 1, delta 2, they are the two uh, sway displacement and out of the four rotations, we take only two rotations as unknown and we take the, uh, the line of symmetry over here and while calculating the stiffness matrix, we take help of the anti-symmetric case. Uh, the stiffnesses uh, of the upper story of the columns are k by 2, k by 2. So, the total stiffness is k for the bottom also the total stiffness of the columns are k. The beams are having uh, a flexural rigidity of E i b and the flexural rigidity of the columns are E i c uh, and the k is equivalent to 12 E i c by L cube uh, the where L is this length beams are also having a length of L. The four uh, E i c by L that turns out to be k L square by 3 uh, from uh, uh, this value of uh, the k which is defined at the top. Uh, similarly, 6 E i by L which will be the uh, stiffness uh, of the beams for the antisymmetric case uh, that can be written as k L square by uh, 2 into alpha 1 where alpha 1 is defined as E i b by E i c. Uh, alpha 1 correspond in, corresponds to theta 1 and alpha 2 corresponds to theta 2. In general, we can call it as alpha this ratio. Now, the rotation that takes place uh, at the end of the beam and the moment that is developed uh, that can be related with the help of this relationship. Uh, say r is equal to theta uh, that we can write as 6 E i b by L and that in turn can be written as 6 alpha E i c by L and from that one can write down alpha to be is equal to r L by 6 E i c. Uh, and uh, for uh, the top uh, beam it will be alpha 1 that is r 1 L by 6 E i c and for uh, these uh, rotation theta 2 it will be alpha 2. Now, as uh, the when the cross section over here they undergo yielding, uh, then uh, the E i b the flexural rigidity of the beam uh, they basically do not uh, come into picture and it is very difficult then to uh, define uh, the stiffness of the beam in this particular fashion. Uh, it is possible so long it is in the elastic state and therefore, the rotation r basically uh, is brought into picture. Uh, we calculate the rotations 
at this particular ends after the yielding and once we get the rotations uh, then uh, the value of alpha uh, can be computed uh, with the help of uh, this uh, relationship or this equation and once we get the value of alpha uh, then we write down the stiffness matrix of the system uh, in terms of uh, alpha that I uh, show you. Now, the beams uh, they have a elastoplastic property or elastic perfectly plastic property. Uh, so, the MP1, MP2 and MP3 or in other words uh, the, the plastic moment capacities of the two beams they are the same. And uh, assuming them to be same and considering the antisymmetric property of uh, the uh, frame, we can write down the total stiffness matrix by equation 6.28a and in which you can see that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are existing. This alpha 1 and alpha 2 have been described and uh, it has been brought into picture because uh, after the yielding has taken place then simply we will uh, find out the values of alpha 1 and alpha 2 uh, from the, uh, the current values of moment and rotation. Uh, in the beginning of uh, the calculation uh, that is when the system is in the elastic state alpha 1 and alpha 2 they are equal to uh, E i b by E i c or 6 E i b by 6 E i c. Uh, now, uh, once uh, we write down the stiffness matrix in terms of the 4 degrees of freedom, then we condense out the rotational degrees of freedom and uh, after uh, the rotational degrees of freedom are condensed out, uh, then we get the k bar delta uh, that is the condensed stiffness matrix with respect to delta and one can see that the expression of the k bar delta contains alpha 1 and alpha 2. Uh, the, therefore, uh, the alpha 1 and alpha 2 uh, are to be calculated at every uh, step uh, of the uh, incremental loading. Now, equation of motion of the frame uh, can be written in this particular way that is m uh, delta x double dot c delta x dot plus k bar delta t uh, delta x. Uh, k bar delta t uh, denotes the a stiffness matrix uh, which remain constant over the increment of uh, uh, incremental time delta t. And um, in the beginning of the delta t we whatever stiffness matrix we get uh, that is the value of k bar and with the help of that uh, stiffness matrix uh, we calculate the responses for uh, the incremental loading over a incremental a time period of delta t time uh, delta t. Uh, on the right hand side we have got minus m i delta x double dot g that is the usual equation. In writing down the C matrix uh, we make uh, an assumption. Uh, in fact, C matrix if we assume the proportional uh, stiffness uh, damping matrix uh, then uh, the uh, value of the C matrix may change. Uh, as uh, the value of the k matrix changes at every instant. But in that case uh, the system uh, uh, will be having varying damping matrix. So, in order to uh, simplify the problem what we do is that uh, we assume the C matrix to be is equal to mass and stiffness proportional where stiffness is the initial stiffness of the system. So, with the help of that uh, we ca calculate the C matrix and using that C matrix we go ahead with the further calculation. Uh, the solution requires k bar delta to be computed at uh, every uh, instant of time t and this requires alpha 1 and alpha 2 to be calculated. Now, we use the following steps uh, for calculating the values of our alpha 1 and alpha 2. Uh, for a particular increment uh, of loading, uh, we calculate uh, the uh, incremental displacement that is delta x i minus 1 uh, uh, to calculate the final uh, displacement x i uh, 
Similarly, uh, we record the, uh, the velocity uh, x dot i uh, that can be obtained uh, by finding out the, uh, the velocity at the i minus 1th uh, step that is in the beginning of the delta t time. And uh, after we have calculated the response over the increment the loading, uh, then we get the delta x i minus 1 and delta x dot i minus 1 and when we add them together we get the uh, value of the velocity at the i th time station. Similarly, one can calculate uh, the value of the bending moment at the i th uh, time station uh, at, a cross, at a cross section of the beam and uh, in uh, obtaining uh, the uh, bending moment at the i th time step. Uh, we uh, need to know the delta m i minus 1 and delta m 2 i minus 1 that is at the two uh, ends of the beams. Uh, for that uh, what we have to do is that uh, we should be able to find out the values of the delta uh, 1 i minus 1 and delta theta 2 i minus 1 that is the incremental rotations uh, at those two sections these incremental rotations are obtained uh, using the previous equation in which alpha values are calculated as uh, the following. And uh, uh, the equation 6.29 uh, is nothing but uh, uh, this equation uh, that is uh, the uh, uh, equation which is which relates theta and delta and they are alpha 1 and an alpha 2 both the things are required. Uh, so, these uh, alpha values are calculated using this relationship alpha 1 is equal to r i minus 1 l divided by 6 e i c and alpha 2 is equal to r 2 i minus 1 l divided by 6 e i c that we have uh, derived before. And uh, the uh, value of r i minus 1 and r 2 i minus 1 uh, they are obtained from the moment that is existing uh, uh, at i minus 1 net time step and the rotation is also known at i minus 1 net time step. Uh, so, by dividing the moment by the rotation we can get the value of r i minus 1. Similarly, one can calculate the value of r 2 i minus 1 uh, by dividing the moment and that is existing at the i minus 1 a time step for the, uh, the second beam um, divided by the rotation that takes place uh, for the second beam. And once we get the values of r i minus 1 and r 2 i minus 1, then those values are used to calculate the values of alpha 1 and alpha 2 for calculating the value of delta theta i minus 1 and delta theta 2 i minus 1. And once we uh, get those values, uh, then with the help of uh, those rotational values, uh, incremental rotational values and the incremental displacement, one can calculate delta m 1 i minus 1 and delta m 2 i minus 1. And uh, after we add it to the existing already existing values of the moment, then we get the final moment at m 1 i. Uh, and m 2 i. And once we get the values of m 1 i and m 2 i, uh, then these values are used for calculating the values of alpha 1 and alpha 2 for the subsequent time step. And that is how we proceed. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, beginning of uh, the problem, the values of alpha 1 and alpha 2 as I told you before will be equal to uh, e i b by e i c. Now, if elastoplastic state is assumed, um, uh, then uh, the values of alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 is equal to 0 when uh, m 1 m 2 uh, becomes equal to m p at the beginning of a uh, uh, time interval. And uh, for uh, uh, unloading uh, case, uh, then uh, we uh, make sure that uh, the uh, initial or uh, the, the, the stiffness of the system becomes equal to uh, 
the initial stiffness. So, in this particular way uh, uh, one can uh, mod find out the uh, stiffness says of the system uh, that is the total stiffness of the system uh, at uh, any increment of uh, time delta t and uh, with the help of that stiffness uh, we calculate the incremental displacement that is displacement and rotations uh, for the system for the incremental loading. Now, this is uh, um, uh, further explained uh, with the help of uh, this example over here. Uh, this is an example of a three story frame and here we have got uh, delta 1, delta 2, uh, delta uh, 3, these are the three sway displacements. Uh, uh, we have uh, the rotations these rotations are theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 on the right hand side of the uh, beam and uh, on the left hand side of the beam we have got theta 4, uh, theta 5 and theta 6. Uh, so, they are the rotations on the left hand side. Uh, the sections are marked as 1 and 2 where the yielding can take place. 3 and 4 where the yielding um, can take place and 5 and 6 where the yielding can take place. Uh, the uh, elastoplastic property of uh, the, uh, the rotation and moment that is shown over here, uh, we call this as the general force displacement curve. In fact, here it is the moment rotation curve. Uh, at uh, a value of the bending moment of 500 kilo Newton meter, uh, uh, we have uh, is equal to the MP value and uh, the yield rotation is given as 0 0.00109 radian. Uh, this is the value of the E uh, for uh, the material, the beam section is this and column section is this. Uh, the stiffnesses uh, are uh, given as uh, k, k, k for the column. Uh, the uh, we consider uh, the uh, values of the rotations and the displacement, and at t is equal to 1.36 second, uh, these values are given uh, in the uh, following table. Uh, that is as joint. 1, 3, 5 and 2, 4, 6 that is 1, 3, 5 are the left hand joint of the beams and the uh, 2, 4, 6 are the right hand uh, cross sections of the beam and the left hand side is 1, 3, 5. Uh, so, they are basically um, uh, shown over here as joint and at time uh, step 1.36 uh, we have the displacement uh, x as equal to g 0 0 0.00293. Uh, then for uh, uh, the displacement uh, next is 0 0.00701 and uh, 0 0.00978. So, uh, these displacements uh, are the displacement corresponding to uh, uh, the delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 and uh, since uh, in the left hand side and the right hand side uh, the displacement, these displacement are the same uh, that is uh, if we assume the members to be extensible, uh, then uh, those displacements are repeated over here uh, 0 0.00293, 0 0.00701 and 0 0.00978. Mind you, this is the top displacement, this is the middle story displacement, and this is the bottom story displacement. The uh, velocities corresponding to these sway displacements uh, they are recorded over here, and you see again that there is a repetition over here because on both sides we have the same displacement. Uh, then this is the acceleration which is recorded over here uh, at time 1.36. Uh, this is the rotation uh, that is taking place at 1, 3, 5 
uh, these rotations are 0 0.00109, 0 0.30.95 0 and 0 0.0053. So, uh, these are the rotations and we can see that at joint 1 uh, the rotation is uh, maximum uh, that is at uh, this section over here the rotation is maximum that is in the bottom uh, column or bottom beam uh, the rotation here and the rotation here they should be same because of the anti-symmetry and these two rotations are, are, are maximum and then we have the rotation for this beam, then we have the rotation for this beam. Uh, so, these uh, rotations are uh, listed over here, the rotational velocities uh, they are shown over here, uh, again uh, the, they are uh, of the same nature in both uh, uh, the sides the rotational accelerations are also shown over here. Uh, with the help of uh, these rotational uh, rotations and the displacement, uh, one can calculate uh, the bending moment at the two ends of the lower beam and for the two ends of the lower beam the bending moment is equal to 50. And, uh, next uh, for the next beam it is 23.18 uh, and uh, it is 42.89 uh, for the other beam. So, we can see that uh, the bending moment uh, at the bottom beam uh, that has reached the yield value because the yield value is given as 500. Uh, k n m or 50 k n m uh, that is uh, given over here. Uh, therefore, uh, the uh, in the table in the first joint and the second joint uh, which are the two joints of the bottom beam, uh, they are the bending moments have reached the yield value. Uh, and uh, for the other two beams, uh, the yield values of the moments are not reached. Uh, therefore, uh, section on 1 and 2 undergo yielding recognizing that uh, we write down the stiffness matrix uh, for the system uh, for delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 uh, these are the uh, 3 displacements and uh, for theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 uh, they are the rotations. Uh, at one end of the beam and theta 4, theta 5, theta 6 are the rotations at the other end of the beam. So, they are shown over here uh, theta 1, uh, theta 2, theta 3 they are the rotations on the right hand side of the beam and theta 4, theta 5, theta 6 are the rotations on the left hand side of the beam. Now, uh, for that we write down uh, the stiffness matrix and we can see that in the stiffness matrix corresponding to delta 1, uh, we have in the first column 1.067 and uh, then corresponding to delta 2 in the column it will be minus 1.067. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, displacement delta 3. Uh, so, for the delta 3 uh, uh, there is there it will be 0. Uh, then we come to rotations uh, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 uh, the corresponding to the value of theta 1 that is the rotation uh, on the right hand side rotation of the top beam uh, the value is point, coefficient is 0 0.8 uh, for the next beam the coefficient is 0 0.8 and note that for the third beam that is the bottom beam the right hand side uh, coefficient is written as 0 it is written 0 because the yielding has taken place over here. Therefore, for subsequent uh, time interval uh, and subsequent increment of loading, uh, what uh, will be done is that we will replace uh, that plastic hinge by ordinary hinge and which cannot uh, take any moment. Therefore, it, it becomes 0. Uh, 
similarly uh, corresponding to theta 6 uh, we also uh, put 0. Uh, in that same fashion uh, the second column, third column, fourth column they have all been generated. Uh, in that case uh, we have uh, made sure that uh, at the bottom beam or the first story beam at the two ends of the beam uh, uh, there is uh, the moment uh, uh, coefficients will be equal to 0 because we consider they are the ordinary uh, hinge. And after we have written down uh, these uh, total stiffness matrix then only we condense out the rotational uh, part of it and land up in the 3 by 3 stiffness matrix that is the condensed stiffness matrix. So, that is how we uh, proceed uh, with the uh, calculation uh, for uh, a particular frame uh, given uh, the values at, uh, at a particular uh, time uh, 1.36. Uh, and we wish to find out say uh, the values or, uh, or responses at 1.38. In that case uh, the stiffness matrix that we will be uh, using uh, uh, for finding out the uh, responses at 1.38 or over that incremental uh, uh, loading over the uh, time increment uh, they are uh, these k delta matrix will be used. So, let me summarize uh, what we uh, discussed uh, uh, today. Uh, we have extended uh, the concept of uh, the, um, uh, the inelastic analysis of uh, the two dimensional and three dimensional frame systems. Uh, for uh, the uh, two dimensional and three dimensional frame systems in which the columns are weaker than the beam. Uh, then uh, the uh, yielding will take place uh, in the column ends. Uh, for the case of uh, 2D frames, uh, there will be uh, a one way bending and therefore, the problem becomes easier. Uh, we have to only make sure that the bending moment which is computed at any particular cross section whether it is equal to the MP value or not. For the case of uh, the uh, three dimensional frame if the columns uh, undergo yielding uh, then uh, we have to take into account the bidirectional interaction on the yielding in order to compute the uh, stiffness matrix of the element by incorporating a plastic component of the stiffness and then assemble the elemental stiffness matrices to find out the total stiffness matrix and uh, go ahead with the calculation. Uh, when the system is a weak beam strong column uh, then for both 2D and 3D frame uh, the problem uh, becomes uh, the same because the beams can undergo only one way bending therefore, the problem becomes easier. But only thing that is to be taken into account is that uh, whenever there is a, 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 a a hinge that is forming at the beam cross section then the rotations are to be condensed out and uh, these rotations are in condensing out these rotations uh, we have to take uh, note of uh, certain uh, special conditions uh, that is the values of r or the values of alpha that we discussed and with the help of that technique uh, we uh, modify the stiffness matrix uh, whenever uh, any yielding has taken place at a particular cross section of the beam.